This amazing piece of art, which is figure 536 in our textbook, is a bronze warrior standing well over six feet in height. It's coming in at six and a half feet, in fact. It is one of the rare bronzes that we have, and the way we have it is it was salvaged from the sea in 1972. A diver, a scuba diver on vacation saw an arm sticking out of the muck in the murky waters below and let authorities know who immediately brought in uh, archaeologists to investigate and to bring this, there were two of them actually, bring this and another piece up for restoration, which took years to accomplish, but the pieces are almost pristine. Looks like they were made yesterday. It shows us a number of things. One is, a, again, ideal naturalism, a kind of blend with of naturalism with idealism. And as a part of the idealism, I want to suggest the confidence and optimism that was a strong part of the Greek worldview after the defeat of the Persians. This is a warrior, but I think you have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that this is a warrior who is also a winner. He is someone who can achieve and who can be victorious on the battlefield. He is very masculine and also very, very, very strong and has uh, great muscles, fully developed muscles throughout his body. He stands with certainty and with confidence. He is a figure who announces to everyone who sees him that he is a capable warrior and indeed a winner. Uh, as part of the Greek uh, worldview, he is shown as someone who is experienced. He knows the battlefield. He's been there. And that's conveyed to us by the beard that he is wearing, which again references a man of maturity, not a boy, but someone who is seasoned. At the same time, this is a figure who is shown in his prime. By prime, I mean at his peak, the same way we would say uh, describe a basketball player who is at the height of his career. This man is in his prime. He is a successful, experienced warrior. He is self-confident. He is sure of himself, and he emotes a quality of masculine strength. And at the same time is also, in terms of art, a much more lifelike figure than we have seen before. And the reason for that is by the time we get to the middle of the 5th century BCE, the Greeks have introduced something new. There are two ways of describing it. One is as a weight shift, and the other is the word contrapasto. Uh, both of the terms uh, describe exactly the same thing, and what it references is a shift of weight. I guess I favor the weight shift because it's a more direct description of actually what is taking place. The weight, instead of being placed evenly on both feet, and that was still true for the charioteer, by the way, but here the weight is only on one leg and one foot. The other foot and leg are resting. When you do that, your hip juts out, and it will be on the side of the leg that's doing the work. The entire body moves into a curve, and I think you can see the curving shape that actually moves through this figure. It's a kind of S-curve that animates the figure and actually makes it look as if it could move in space. Again, like the charioteer, the head turns a little bit to the side, so it's breaking with the central axis. But in this case, it's a much more lifelike depiction because of the weight shift that is being employed. The Greeks did everything in a rational way. They did, at the end of the day, in fact, actually believe that beauty was rational, that it was something that you could calculate. So our warrior is based upon very carefully studied proportions of the human body. And we actually have remainders of texts written by Greek sculptors who highlight what those proportions would be. In the classical period, and we're not going to look at all the proportions because that would make us crazy, but in the classical period, I'm going to give you one, and it will be the number of heads high that the figure stands. So if we took this, the head, as a 
unit of measure. And we counted down through the length of the body. We would discover that the body stands seven, approximately, seven heads in height. What that does is give us a set of proportions, making a, I'm going to say, kind of stockily built, a heavily set, very strong, very masculine individual. And in this case, it works particularly well in expressing and defining the idea of what a warrior is. At the same time, the artists also calculated how we might oppose working and relaxed limbs. So going to the right, this is the working side of the body, the leg and the hip that is working. The arm next to it is the relaxed arm. On the opposite side, over here, we have an arm that's raised. That is the working arm. So there are a couple ways artists can do this. This is one of them. To oppose working and relaxed limbs to bring complete balance and harmony to a work of art. When this was brought up, it was brought up with its mate, but without the weapons that almost certainly it once upon a time had. This warrior would have held a lance in this hand, his right hand. And in the lower right corner, I have a little kind of reconstruction of what a Greek warrior would look like going into battle. So in his right hand, he would advance with a lance along with a line of other warriors with his left arm. And you can probably see just a little bit left right here. That was once upon a time attached to a spear. He would protect himself. So he would create essentially a line of protection, a shield wall, as these Greek warriors advanced uh, one next to the other. We've lost those pieces, but we can imagine, I think, what this would have looked like, a grand and imposing warrior fully armed. Now, of course, soldiers did not go into the battlefield without their clothes on, so he would have also had a military uni uniform on uh, and protective gear that was part of that. This, however, again, is a depiction of the heroic nude showing human beings as they can attain perfection. And I think in many ways, our warrior has done that. This is a view of, on the left, upper left, what this looked like when it was first discovered. It was brought, it had been down there in the water uh, for uh, centuries and centuries, so it was covered with mineral deposits. It did need to be restored and to be cleaned. I'm also showing you the face of the diver who found it, and um, I have to say this guy is glowing. It's probably the high point of his lifetime. Uh, the Greeks did take the piece because it belongs to them. It was in waters off their shore, and therefore the object does indeed belong to the Greeks. But they did give the young man a finder's fee of 100,000 uh, bucks. That is, of course, a tiny fraction of the value of this object. Nevertheless, the less, it was a pretty nice finder's fee uh, to uh, give to someone. Uh, this is a view of uh, the figure from behind and I think it is even more effective from behind because you can see the S curve running through the body and I think it maybe is easier to see even the weight shift back here but it again uh, shows us uh, the way in which the Greeks also are focusing on the muscles making this figure look strong in his prime but nevertheless very ideal. This is a closer look at the face of our warrior, uh, giving you perhaps the ability to compare it with an earlier piece. Uh, it is figure introduction, figure I-17. So it's in the introduction of our textbook. I just want to put it up next to an Akkadian head which we looked at from the ancient Near East very early, um, let's say around 2000 BCE. Uh, these are a part in time, but they're also a part in terms of ideals of what is beautiful and how an artist should work. The artists of the Greek world in the classical period are striving, consciously striving for naturalism. So we have an increased lifelike quality. 
we have taken away the symmetry that makes things look stiff and static. And in particular, you can see that in the beard of the individual. You can also see a good sense of the bone structure of the face, as well as the features, the mouth, the nose, and the eyes. Again, these are inlaid. Because they were underwater, they haven't survived quite as well. But they end up adding to the lifelike quality of the piece. Most of the artworks from the Greek world do not survive as originals. We have to get an idea of what they look like through Roman copies. The Romans will conquer the Greeks in the second century BCE, and one of the things they're going to respect about the Greeks is their artistic skills. So they're going to import a lot of bronze originals and have copies made often in marble and this is one of those it is again by a known artist uh, who was very very famous but it is a roman copy of the guy's name is myron of myron's discus thrower figure uh, 540 in our textbook he is shown uh, in the act of throwing the discus and if we follow along beginning with the discus a curving line running through the arms, the shoulders, the other arm, which overlaps the knee and continues down the line of the leg. You can see that there's a continuous sweeping curve to add to the sense of potential energy and movement in this piece. It should also suggest that there is a primary view intended for this. We can still walk around it and see it from all directions, but it was intended to be seen from one vantage point and from that vantage point, it would enhance the sense of movement and the sense of energy in the work of art. How do we know this is a Roman copy? Well, first of all, there are several versions of it, which helps us to make that call. But in addition to that, when the Romans take a bronze original and carve it in uh, marble, it doesn't the marble version doesn't have the same kind of strength that bronze does so you need to give it a support and this carved tree trunk located right here which helps the marble piece stand up is one of the hints that we might indeed be looking at a Roman copy in addition uh, the artist often needs to add in additional supports these are referred to as struts and this is one of them right here between the hand and the leg to be sure that the arm as it moves into space does not in fact break off. So we have hints that allow us to determine when a work of art is an original and when a work of art is a copy. This is a pretty good copy, we're going to say, and very true to the spirit of the ancient Greeks. Uh, to throw a discus is a lot of work, and a real athlete would not just be functioning physically, but he'd be showing his emotion on his face. This individual, true to the classical ideals of restraint and order and control, shows absolutely no expression whatsoever. He shows us instead this idea of good behavior, of perfect behavior that the ancient Greeks would strive to maintain. So what I would like to suggest here is that this is an example of perfect body and this is a perfect athlete, but coupled with perfect mind and that's what the Greeks, Greeks were really trying to strive for to show us the perfect physical form but also to show us a restrained human being and control of his emotions and that is shown really through a, a serene expression almost an expressionless expression coupling together the two components of body and mind in a very very ideal way the Greeks also in this period give us the first example, I think, of the athlete as hero, and we still look back to the ancients, the ancient Greeks, for this because today we also respect the athlete as a hero.